Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now, when such, such conceptions become, such, such, such analysis becomes very important, okay, we tend to look at different, we, we tend to witness a different economy and within that new economy, different economy, we get, we tend to witness new classes, okay, which may be different from the conventional Marxist notion of classes, which according to Marx were manifestations of economic differentiation. Okay? Okay? In this context, what we are going to do? We are going to discuss uh, three th important things. One is how Marx's notion of class may be rejected, how Marx's notion of class may be reasserted and how Marx's notion of class may be reconceptualized. Okay? I mean, there are different ways what, what uh, in, in the poverty of philosophy, what Marx said, Marx wrote that, uh, that uh, a handmill give you a society with a feudal lord, whereas a steam mill with that of the industrial capital. Okay. Marx has been wrongly dubbed as, um, as, a, uh, as a technologically determinist, uh, technological determinist, but it is not correct. To Marx was trying to uh, look at hand mill or steam mill, uh, so far as the debates on mode of production are concerned. Okay. Now, what David Lyon tried to do? David Lyon tried to look at look at uh, this that uh, what is this new what kind of new classes okay, which have surfaced which have appeared in the context of the information society if if you say that uh, 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 a hand mill gives you a society with a feudal lord, whereas a steam mill with that of the industrial capitalist, then, then what does the computer give us? What does the coming of IT mean for class and power in today's world? Okay? A form of a form of agrarian capitalism preceded the, the, the steam mill. Capitalism is not limited to industrial production then why capitalism should not continue to help shape the development of new technologies? This is, I mean, I mean, this is a pivotal question for any theory of information society. If I say that a form of agrarian capitalism preceded the steam mill, capitalism is not limited to industrial production, okay? then there is no a priori reason why capitalism should not continue to help the, the help set the uh, development of new technologies. Okay? A priori means prior to experience, a posteriori means post experience. Okay? Uh, now prior to experience, prior to empiricism. Okay? The, the question before us is whether or not information technologies and their associated industrial and social processes actually help change the rules of the game. Daniel Bell uh, offers this as a clear alternative to Marx's equivalent uh, treatment of capital. For the, uh, what, uh, for the sake of clarity, uh, David Lyon tried to identify three kinds of answers. One, 
new technology holds hope for abandoning class classlessness achieved by technical not social revolution okay as the protagonists of it uh, propound for as a conceptual uh, causality of change this is class rejected two secondly it merely strengthens the hand of the already powerful capitalist class giving it a wider global scope and tools for tighter social control and this is class rejected oh, sorry class reasserted three thirdly marx is now outdated but not because classes are disappearing the introduction of new technology tilts the balance of power in different ways realigning classes and religion new social movements this is class reconceptualized let us discuss these three in detail first class rejected many proponents of the information society give the impression that new social relationships appear all around old fashioned capitalism and socialism are frequently said to be doomed by the arrival of information technology i mean new uh, not only has the white collar sector dwarfed the blue collar which in itself has class implications but today's industrial and political trends according to uh, uh, nice bit uh, are leading the advanced societies away from hierarchy and domination to networking and participation without disputing claims either that it could be used in liberating and egalitarian ways or that potentially desirable alterations are occurring within organization and in other social relationships it seems clear that these kinds of accounts are mistaken when they ignore or minimize questions of class and power okay as is so frequently the case the supposed technical promise is confused with social reality it is not a class corrosive tool rather it widens it has widened the class differences class distinctions okay and therein lies the significance of component of reassertion of class class reasserted marxist Mm, uh, uh, analysis suggest that while information technology does play a significant role within capitalist societies it does not alter the fundamental relations of production which lie at their base as uh, david uh, albery and joseph squarch put it the so called microprocessor revolution is part of the effort of capital to ensure its continued domination over social and economic development during a period of crisis and change the myth of technological progress serves to disguise the class interest at work behind the introduction of these machines marxists efforts are dedicated to exposing and countering that class interest one could say that marxism is a theory of technological societies that's what marxism has been marx has been dubbed that uh, is a technological determinist okay it is wrong what he why he is dubbed why he has been wrongly uh, cited i mean nature is transformed by people using tools marx wrote nature builds no machines no locomotives no railways electric telegraph self acting mules etc these are products of human industry the power of knowledge objectified so human activity is mediated through technology but it is class activity marx is very important even today in 2017 okay it would be possible to write a whole history of the inventions made since 1830 for the sole purpose of providing capital with weapons against working class revolts we would mention above all the self acting mule because it opened up a new epoch in the automatic system okay it is the view that new technology is solely bound up with class struggle because it assists in the exploitative accumulation process that characterizes marxist accounts the use of machines or machine factory assembly lines scientific management and now automation and robotics is 
seen as an ongoing way of perpetuating the interests of capital at the expense of labor. It may eat into new areas, expanding new into consumption, especially the domestic sphere, culture and previously unaffected parts of the globe, but it is essentially the same process at work. The continuing importance of the legal ownership of capital, whatever the changes in its composition on the one hand and the still considerable strength of the historical working class movement on the other remain the key factors for Marxist analysis. Marxist discussions on IT take these items as read, although the internalization of capital via the big global corporations is often described as the monopoly capital stage. The primary rationale for technological change then is to restructure capitalism, so that nations and companies may be better placed to compete in the global market place. In the effort to accomplish this, it is argued unions and the working class in general may expect to be threatened by both by legislation aimed to curb their power and by de-skilling and job losses. The, the, issue, the issue of de-skilling, you can also look at Harry Braverman's work on de-skilling, okay? uh, uh, technology and capitalist control, labor and monopoly capital. Uh, it's a it's an epoch making book on on de-skilling. The 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 issue of de-skilling has formed a dominant motif within the Marxist debate over information technology. The work of Harry Braverman, which focuses on the effects of separating mental from manual labor, has been a huge stimulus to the class analysis of automation. Although uh, Braverman's own conclusions are now widely regarded as uh, uh, flawed or something, but, 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 but one thing one must understand, the consequences of that uh, divorce continue to be researched. Other ways in which the ongoing relevance of class analysis to IT is stressed include the idea of cultural control, as well as the elite network of corporations, foundations, universities. Uh, policy planning groups and government bodies which seeks to harmonize the interests of capital and filter out challenge to its hegemony. The fact that information technology is poised for a major expansion into the domestic sphere also bodes ill for consumers. It can also be predicted that the new home communication set uh, far from introducing a rich range of fresh entertainment and services, more and more spheres of social life. I mean, monopoly capitalism stretches its um, tentacles into the area of consumption as well as production. To the question, what does the computer mean for the social class in today's world? Most uh, 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 Marxists would say, uh, so would reply uh, more of the same, I mean, according to David Lyon. A revolution of the fixed will is an appropriate characterization um, as, uh, opined by um, Robbins and Webster. So far, from facilitating a new classless situation of open opportunities, the smashing of hierarchy and free time, IT reinforces the contradictions within capitalism originally identified by Marx. The relentless quest for accumulation pushes capital to penetrate new domains both on a global and on a domestic level as well as tightening the screw of ex exploitation within the productive workforce. Discussion of Marx, IT and class continues um, to be significant. I mean, because the nature of class is perceived to have altered by some who still use Marx as a kind of theoretical uh, a springboard. And because this also rings bells with others who would not begin with Marxian analysis at all. I mean, that is why it is, it is of paramount significance that, that, uh, mm, that we must try to reconceptualize Marx's notion of class. I mean, the essential two class model of classic uh, Marxism is no longer on the, on the, in the foreground, rather, uh, um, but, but Marx also uh, pointed out that there will be so many intermediary classes within this two class model of classic Marxism. Okay? Uh, now, then, then we will let us see how 
the the the, the uh, how how Marx's notion of class uh, can be conceptualized. Having discussed the aspects of class rejected and class rejected, now we will discuss class reconceptualized. Within the post industrial society, according to Daniel Bell, workers in the predominant service sectors, when, when I say predominant service sectors, I mean it may be health, it may be education, it may be research, it may be government sectors and so on. I mean workers in the, in the predominant services, namely health, education, research and government comprise the new intelligentsia. And this professional and technical class does the typical work of information society, planning and forecasting, research and development and so on. Wartime emergencies stimulated such activities and post war technological and economic planning took them further. The goal according to the objective the instrumental character of such information technology according to Daniel Bell is to realize a social alchemist's dream that is the dream of ordering the mass society. Then we are creating a new kind of intelligentsia which will order mass society. Like, like Saint Simon, uh, Daniel Bell seemed to survey this technocratic sin without qualm. Why should society not be organized more rationally? Having once referred to a knowledge class, nevertheless, Bell uh, now denies both that it is a class on the model of the bourgeois and that it could be and that it could rule, it could be the owners. Toffler agrees with Bell in this context. Third wave advocates including the mainstream of intellectuals, information workers and technicians are engaged in a struggle, but it is primarily a struggle for liberation from the second wave existence that is the industrial society, European modernist paradigm within sociology okay? and only by twisting the term could one call them a class. Other observers are not so sure knowledge work or and some information work may well confer power on those engaged in it. It appears to us that as those with access to the decision making machinery gain power, so others experience progressive powerlessness. Today's uh, top managers, managers at the top level can have more relevant information readily available at their fingertips and may well be able to make executive decisions affecting subordinates without consulting them. Is access to and control of significant information replacing property as a new source of class division? This is important. Okay. David Lyon tried to put this debate in context, in perspective. The, the concept of a new class cannot be separated from wider arguments over social classes and the potential of any one of them to transform industrial capitalism. Then the concept of new class is inseparable from wider arguments over social classes and the potential of any one of them to transform industrial capitalism. Non-Marxist sociologists believe that social change has rendered irrelevant the Marxist account of class and class conflict. This includes the diffusion of capital by shareholding, the rise of managerial power, uh, the institutionalization of class conflict within industrial relations and, and the growth of the welfare state. Marxists uh, on the other hand while admitting that social changes can occur insist that their import does not fatally damage Marxist accounts and they are right. I mean the key problem for our purposes, for our objectives, for, for, for our aims, for our goals 
okay, is that of the so called middle classes. Uh, Marx said many intermediary classes, okay. <coughs> petty bourgeois. Okay. Marxism assumes a polarization of two fundamental conflicting social interests, namely labor and capital. Okay. Always there will be a conflict between labor and capital as the two mm, important factors of production. Okay. But even Marx recognized the difficulty of placing themselves, placing intermediate strata within this scheme. Various revisionists have attempted to cope with this difficulty during the 20th century, but it was in the 1960s that several theories appeared which linked the middle class problem with the new technology. That is that is that's, that's, that's fatal, I mean that that is wrong to attribute this. A number of French sociologists like uh, Mallard, Gorge and others claimed that a new working class segment could be observed within high technology products. Higher educational and skills level and more communal patterns of work organization within the new working class enabled them to see more clearly the contradictions inherent within capital. Their inferior rewards and their lack of control became more visible. This insight can in fact be traced to Marx, who foresaw the progress of that, that the progress of technology meant that the human being comes to relate more as a watchman and a regulator of the production process. The implication being that this would also create space for workers to see themselves in this light. Such ideas have been counted in several ways. However, uh, high tech workers do not necessarily understand the processes in which they are involved. Within a semi automated chemical plant, for example, one study found, according to uh, what which, uh, David Lyon uh, um, pointed it out, that uh, one study found the the majority of, of workers still being unskilled dirty and arduous donkey work big variations of responsibility and skill exist even within apparently uh, homogeneous groups such as technicians there may be skilled and unskilled computer workers and whatever the specific circumstances no clear evidence exists of such such a class trying to overthrow capital for instance, higher degrees of militancy as uh, Duncan uh, Galley uh, found when comparing French with British workers relate more to the way they are treated by management. British managers by more frequently seeking consent contain potential strife. Still debate over the new class continues. Okay? Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the context of the United States of America a third force between the capitalist and working class of traditional Marxism that is the professional managerial class which has emerged. Many in these, I mean the, the professional managerial class essentially cannot come under proletariat nor can it come under uh, the class of bourgeois. Okay. Many in this class, in the class of, I mean in this professional managerial class for various reasons have anti capitalist sentiments, but find themselves in a curious position vis a vis the working class. They are not able to settle themselves with the bourgeois, nor are they able to settle themselves with the proletariat. Both classes confront the capitalist class over the issue of ownership and control of the means of production. They confront each other over the issues of knowledge, skills, culture, and so on. These are also the issues that uh, Abercrombie and Yori uh, emphasize in a British context. The, the, the context was again the context, uh, I mean the, the context was uh, uh, drawn more from the perspective of Weberian uh, um, economy and society. Uh, uh, Abercrombie and Yori uh, hint at the power of what they call the service class to affect the future shape of society. However, they, dis they distinguish between the between this class 
which performs functions relating to capital and discalled white color workers whose position is closer to the traditional proletariat. Then again this professional managerial class is again divided. The middle class that, 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 that between, between bourgeois and the proletariat again is divided. Okay. Uh, one which divided into two groups at least two groups one which, which performs functions relating to capital and the other I mean uh, the other includes uh, discalled white collar workers which position is closer to the traditional proletariat. These discussions bear a strong affinity with a seminal argument in the early 1970s of Alain Turin. For Turin, educational credentials are becoming increasingly important for determining one's class position. The division between manual and mental labor, which was pointed out by Harry Braverman, okay, is it is the the man the div, the, the the division between the separation of mental labor from manual labor okay, is the basis for a new kind of class conflict. Turin did not hesitate to isolate technocrats as a new dominant class whose decision making power is crucial both to maintaining their position and to alienating those denied it. I mean, Thus, in the programmed society, in the wired society, uh, in, in the information society, in the post industrial society, neither farms nor unions are today the chief actors in the struggle for social powers. By the 1980s, Turin would uh, assert that um, socialism is uh, dead okay. by looking at the, 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 the events which occurred throughout the world, especially in the erstwhile Soviet Union. Okay. So far from the bearer of universal project of human emancipation, it is now a mere forum for sectional interests. So, where is the new opposition now? For Turin, resistance comes from the excluded uh, from, from I mean resistance comes from those excluded from participation in the decision making process who find themselves at the mercy of technocracy. They may include trade unionists, feminists, ecologists, uh, members of peace movements, people involved in alternative media and so on. Widespread support for the environmentalist group namely Greenpeace, the alternative plan for socially useful products and drawn up uh, by the lookout. Uh, aerospace, uh, aerospace combine or the opposition of computer scientists to the SDI program are examples of the kind of resistance Turin has in mind. Of course, counteracting uh, the technocracy is not easy. If you, if you look at uh, the Frankfurt school theorists in Germany, they are also called neo Marxists, okay. they are also called critical theorists like Herbert Marcuse, uh, Jürgen Habermas, uh, they have stri striven to show modern societies are characterized by a pervasive technocratic consciousness. That is to say, that is to say, as more and more attempts are made to run society along rational lines, space for resistance efforts based on a moral or normative critique becomes more and more restricted. Okay. Jack, uh, Jack uh, Elol now once makes a similar point in a different way. The, uh, I mean restricting one's purview towards only technology excludes questions of purpose, questions of objective, goal, only technology. Then you override uh, the interests of the people at large. As informatization occurs, this process is likely to be carried further, thus adding urgency and contemporary relevance to Elul's critique. Understanding, I mean 
understanding this appears to have galvanized at least some computer uh, professionals and others into a quest for appropriate purposes and a socially informed normative approach. Normative approach I mean what should be, what ought to be okay? uh, ethical approach. In the hands of, a, of, of terrain or uh, Habermas, the concept of class struggle is taken a long way beyond Marx. For Habermas in particular, the increased role of science and technology in the production process undermines Marx's reliance on the labor theory of value. And what is labor theory of value? What is surplus labor? See, uh, this is not, uh, I mean, I am not going to teach social theory, but uh, what you, uh, what one should do, I mean, let me give you a simple example. Suppose, a worker gets 800 rupees to do 8 hours of work and per day and if that particular worker if she or he does another 4 hours of work then the, the kind of overtime that he the, the wage that such overtime attracts that that amounts to say 200 rupees more. Then, for 8 hours of work which she or he used to get 800 rupees, then 1 hour of work was equal to 100 rupees. Now, this 4 hours of work is equal to 200 rupees. I mean, 1 hour of work is equal to 50 rupees. Then, instead of 400 rupees, he should have he or she should have earned 400 rupees for four more hours of work. The story does not end here, then one may say that no surplus labor will be only 200 rupees. Instead of 1200 rupees, somebody is getting 1000 rupees. No, now the system is that you are violating the norms of 8 hours a day work and then you are trying to extract the labor from that worker in the process of production, in the assembly line production, in large scale production and then when you violate these norms, but your wages do not, wages should increase. In fact, they do not increase, rather they are on decline. This is what surplus labor, surplus wage okay, is all about. Okay. Then, then on account of which class conflicts occur at times. Then trade unionists, uh, uh, so many other, uh, they, they try to bargain with the management that yes, the, 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 then, then arises the question of class conflicts, class struggles. Class conflicts no longer have the potential in, in, the, in the wake of, in, in, the, in, the, in the way Habermas tried to uh, characterize that class conflicts no longer have the potential to affect the central structures of society. Nevertheless, struggles will go on in the, in the hope of helping direct social change. New movements are appearing according to Turin, which do provide challenges to the status quo, to the powers that be okay, and resistance to the technocratic mentality. But to return to the central question, is it appropriate to think of there being a new class which holds power in any effective sense? The conclusion of Goldthorpe is apposite. Whatever apparent divisions may exist within what he calls the service class, overall professional, uh, administrative and managerial personnel and tend to be basically conservative and are unlikely to change challenge challenge the wide, wider powers that be wider status quo it is it is important to understand the relative importance of universities to control their future let alone that of wider society in the later 20th century and the early part of the 21st century even even today okay 
they are in general less central to knowledge production today such work is commonly done done in in large corporations and government laboratories as well universities in india they have a larger role to play today in the production of knowledge in the dissemination of knowledge that's why university must interact with society okay universities cannot be uh, at the back on back and call of the government universities must be able to interact with our economy culture polity and so on society as a whole moreover what we what we witness today is that that involvement within high tech industries does not necessarily confer power on individuals or groups or communities information workers may in fact be very uh, may in fact be very uh, routinized but have little access to decision making process okay knowledge is power one may say that but it is also a misleading slogan it is also a misleading uh, adage that knowledge is power knowledge may well be important to the maintenance of power but that does not mean that uh, the knowledgeable are always powerful any any ruling elite may use the apparatus of science and technology to buttress their dominant position like us uk okay uh, and daniel bell's notion of knowledge elites may even be indispensable to the uh, 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 running of society but that indispensability does not in itself confer power upon them except in so far as they may be able to limit the activities of their pay masters after all slaves were indispensable to uh, athenian life but had no say in in this in its direction while 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 the changing occupational industrial structure does have implications uh, for class for for class and power okay none of this seems at present to alter the fundamental shape of capitalist industrial societies but and here is the uh, rub capital capitalist uh, industrialist um, uh, i mean they uh, i mean cap, uh, they uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't necessarily exo exhaust the possible ways of describing capturing modern society the growth of technocratic consciousness and opposition to it is a factor that cannot be ignored especially as the whole process of rationalization is augmented by the introduction of information technology okay information certainly does spell power in another context that of surveillance so new social movements which they might not have the potential uh, i mean i mean uh, new social movements while they might not have the potential to transform uh, society single handedly okay as marxian theory requires of class okay may yet point the way to alternative alternative forms of social organization this is how we must be try we, we must try to uh, reconceptualize classes according to david lang in the context of the information society now having discussed class rejected class reasserted and class reconceptualized the 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 cornerstone of the popular information society thesis is that a new information sector comprising un information workers has become a dominant economic factor in the advanced societies but the composition of this cornerstone is fatally crumbling the evidence the evidence points not to an information sector but to the increase of a diverse range of information activities whose social significance depends on a complex series of variables many kinds of work are likely to become information intensive but this does not add up to a new sector as such similarly mistaken is the notion that that the similarly mistaken is the notion that the new classes may be accompanying the spread of information technology education and skills levels are becoming 
a more important criterion for determining social position, but this does not uh, yet at any rate seem to have affected the basic social divisions based on property. Some technocrats may have more power, but do not rule. On the other hand, the simple Marxian view of class polarization is also open to serious question. Okay, in the context of uh, information technology, as as David Lyon pointed out. Okay, the matter cannot be left there. However, consider Turin uh, once more. The value of his alternative view of the programmed society is twofold. Okay, firstly. Turin challenges those bland accounts of a smooth transition to an information society, number one. And secondly, Turin dismisses the idea that class struggle is the only axis along which conflicts occur in modern societies. Okay. Having, having discussed these, okay, that, that, that we, have, we have discussed that how there are two kinds of information society thesis each of which makes uh, two a, a kinds of claims. One popularized view suggests that major social changes for the betterment, more cautious and open ended views suggest that the information society is problematic. The two images of information society overlap and interrelated and thus both try to anticipate the sorts of social change. Okay? We have already discussed the critique of the information society, I mean who wields power. Um, how it obscures the vested interests, uh, uh, and the kind of inequalities, conflicts and underlying contradictions and in terms of dominant ideologies. Okay. From, from here onward, then, then very quickly what have we discussed? Very quickly we will we'll see in the information society issues and illusions what we have discussed. We started with Alvin Toffler's three waves. The first wave is characterized by agricultural society, the second wave is characterized by the industrial society, whereas the third wave is characterized by un information society. There are six grounding principles of the third wave according to Toffler, namely standardization, specialization, synchronization, uh, maximization, concentration and centralization. Standardization is related to the products which are identical in more than one locale. Uh, specialization is related to division of labor, synchronization is related to coordination of events to operate a system in unison, maximization uh, indicates inverse relationship between input and profit, concentration uh, is related to abundance of a constituent divided by the total volume by a, a, a volume of a mixture and centralization is refers to the process by which the activities of an organization, particularly those regarding uh, planning and decision making become concentrated within a particular location or group, keeping all of the important decision making powers within the head office or the center of the organization. From there on, we discussed Daniel Bell's characterization of post industrialism, I mean a post industrial society is one where knowledge has displaced property as the central preoccupation and the prime source of power and social dynamism. Secondly, technicians uh, uh, and professionals are the preeminent social groups and thirdly, service industries are more important than manufacturing industry. Then from post industrialism to information society, social forecasters and uh, social planners uh, and information culture, we have, we have I, mean, uh, I mean information being treated as a commodity. I mean we have discussed this now uh, in the context of Bell's reflection on uh, the coming of post industrial society, I mean centrality of theoretical knowledge, rise to prominence of professional scientific and technical groups, a new social framework based on telecommunications, uh, information is being treated as a commodity, knowledge and inf information supplant labor and capital. Uh, as the central variables of the economy. If you look at basic ec economics, you will find that uh, what are the factors of production? I mean there are four factors of production, land, labor, capital and entrepreneur. And now, and uh, why I am, I am, we are referring to only labor and capital? Because land is fixed. Okay? Land, labor, capital and entrepreneur. Land is a fixed factor of production. 
labor is a variable factor of production. What earlier economists Smith, Ricardo, Marx, uh, others, they, they used to subscribe to labor theory of value and for them it was when labor was the most significant aspect because of certain things. Land is the fixed category, labor is a variable, uh, I mean labor varies, okay. it, is, uh, uh, it is not a fixed category and capital is generated by labor and entrepreneur, what is an entrepreneur? It is one more labor. In this sense, they used to focus mo more on labor, but subsequently labor and capital as they are conflict, they have conflicting interests, okay. historically and materially. Okay. They were considered the dominant uh, variables uh, of the economy, but but in the, in the context of information technology, knowledge and information have displaced labor and capital as the central variables of the economy. And then we witness the end of the industrial capitalist era and the arrival of a service or leisure society and there in what, what kind of functions that IT uh, performs, uh, that IT shortens labor time, diminishes labor time, it diminishes production worker. Then IT shortens labor time, IT diminishes production worker, IT replaces labor as a source of added value in the national product, the way knowledge is created and retrieved, knowledge is being treated as a commodity and the nature of work and occupation has also uh, uh, been subject to changes. Okay. Then in the themes of information society, we have discussed information workers in an information economy, political and global aspects uh, and then uh, an information culture. Within information workers in, inform in an information economy, we have discussed, uh, I mean what we have posed these questions, what does this proliferation of new job description mean? Who are these information operatives? what contributions do their activities make to the pattern of social relationship, uh, what are the parameters uh, through which information may be explained, what is the purpose, function or content of information, what is the relationship between information, knowledge and power with regard to the social significance of research and development and who makes decisions and on what basis or with what effect. In political and global aspects, we have discussed three parameters, one is on the basis of political choice and uh, participation, secondly accessibility and surveillance and thirdly relocation of workers and technology transfer. Within political choice and participation, we have discussed instant referendum and more informed decision making and within accessibility and surveillance, we have discussed more secure society or the threat of an Orwellian society. I mean. Mm, uh, the one which, which we have discussed uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, does the, uh, does the, uh, the, 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 I mean the threat of an Orwellian society, I mean we have discussed does the widespread political and administrative use of extensive databases which allow for the easy storage retrieval and transmission of personal in, uh, information port and of future fraught with the dangers of electronic eavesdropping, eavesdropping. On the one hand, police, defense, social security and other personnel reassure the public that no innocent person need have any worries about improper prying into their private lives. On the other, cases of wrongful dismissal or arrest which are traced to erroneous computer files serve to dwell fears that in fact ordinary citizens may well be at risk. Okay. Within relocation of workers and technology transfer, we have discussed north-south divide, we have discussed digital divide uh, and so on. Okay. And in information culture, we have discussed how there has been a transition from science-based welfare state to a science-based warfare state, thereby we witness a new kind of modernity, a break with the past, altered aesthetic perceptions of time and space, new economic dependencies and new social interactions, new social relationships and so on and new functional and quantitative way of thinking and so on. 
Then we have discussed th there are three factors which influence in information technology namely the military factor, the commercial factor and the government factor. In the in new economy, new classes we have discussed, uh, we started with uh, um, what uh, um, Marx wrote in the poverty of philosophy that a hand mill gives you a society with a feudal lord and the steam mill with that of the industrial capitalist uh, and then what does computer give us? What does the coming of IT mean for class and power in today's world? A form of agrarian capitalism preceded the steam mill capitalism is not limited to only industrial production then why capitalism should not continue to help shape the development of new technologies. Okay? In this context we have discussed how Marx is, I, I mean how the emergence of information technology has reject uh, has rejected reasserted and reconceptualized Marx's notion of class uh, 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 for uh, according to Marx classes are manifestations of economic differentiation, but still economic differentiation has not yet been able to polarize classes on this basis. Okay? And then we try to bring about a critique of the information society that is uh, a popularized view uh, which suggests that major social changes for the betterment of the society uh, uh, more popularized view I mean that is the state's view that is the corporate sector's view, but more causes and open ended views I mean which social scientists scholars of social sciences students of social sciences they espouse that the information society uh, is problematic. And these two images, these two views that popularized view as well as the more causes and open ended views overlap and interrelated thus both try to anticipate the sorts of social change. And as a part of the critique of the information society it may be threefold that who wields power that is the question. I mean intellectual and managerial skills are required to exploit information economically and these are unevenly distributed in society, inequalities, conflicts and underlying contradictions. I mean uh, private gain is constantly set against uh, efforts to socialize production. I mean there is an attempt, there have been attempts to, to nationalize loss and privatize profits. And the dominant ideologies that we encounter that the reality of powerful interests and beliefs at work are at work within it, who dare the question uh, the uh, way in which IT is implemented, new technologies are invested with uh, sacred quality. What is that sacred quality that, that also is a part of dominant ideology. Okay? In this sense, we try to cover the information society and then we will uh, get into a reception of modern science in India as a part of uh, the exercise and then uh, we will we'll discuss uh, science policies in India, but first we will discuss reception of modern science in India and then we will move on to uh, uh, science policies in India. In reception of modern science in India, we will start with uh, the process of democratization of scientific knowledge, I mean the Indian context, institutionalization of modern science in colonial India, uh, then policies of colonial rulers and limitations. Uh, uh, then science was democratized in Indian context through building scientific institutions. Namely, this is very important I mean the, the native intellectuals during uh, the colonial period in, in, the, uh, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, they had two options before them when modern science was introduced, was implanted in Indian soil. The first option was to convince themselves that the best products of modern science were already anticipated by what they considered to be the national philosophy of India, namely the Vedanta. It is this concern uh, which has been expressed in the works of Vivekananda, Aurobindo and many others. For western world it was at best ethno philosophical in nature, at best. Okay. And the second option was to build an indigenous tradition of modern science by establishing scientific institutions for pedagogy and research. And this second option is sociolo so sociologically significant and in this context as a part of process of not merely popularizing, but also democratizing scientific knowledge in India 
scientific institutions were built by the native intellectuals in the second half of the 19th century. In this section, we will discuss the Hindu college, the Delhi college, the Aligarh scientific society, the Bihar scientific society and the Indian association for the cultivation of science. And there and from there on we will uh, we'll move on to the scientific policy resolution. In the next lecture, we are going to start with uh, the reception of modern science in India. Thank you.